So, our next speaker, Louis Terrell, he is studying for a physics degree here at Imperial in the hopes of legitimizing his plans for world optimization. <laughs> nice. Uh, this year, his proposal is a bit more down to earth, but only in the literal sense. Put your hands together for Louis. <laughs> Good evening. My talk is on shark attack prevention, by which I mean preventing attacks on sharks. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm aware this may come as a surprise. I'm sure all of you will probably have seen the latest viral video about some gadget intended to protect surfers from sharks. If not this one, then maybe one of these. <laughs> um, you get the idea. There are a lot of these devices out there. But looking at all these inventions with the same aim, we have to ask ourselves, is this really a utilitarian distribution of our limited resources? <laughs> we can answer this question by considering a matrix containing the number of humans killed by sharks each year on average, eight, and the number of sharks killed by humans, uh, 100 million. This is such a staggeringly huge number that I really don't have a good way of conveying its size to you. If I was a popular science writer, I might try comparing it to the equivalent in blue whales. But that just feels inappropriate in this context. <laughs> <laughs> so it's obvious that the current state of research is fundamentally unjust. Um, it, it, it treats shark lives as worth less than a millionth of a human life. And we can quantify this inequality using the Gini coefficient. Um, <laughs> it turns out... It turns out that this distribution of deaths is within a millionth of being as unequal as is mathematically possible. So, what can we do to help the true victims here? We can start with perhaps the only research which has been conducted in this area, attaching laser pointers to shark fins, especially <laughs> in plants, which has been done. Unfortunately, it's not particularly practical. Ignoring questions of recharging or repair, um, it's trivial to calculate the power which would be required to have any impact at all for a metre of water. And it turns out that this would produce so much waste heat that it would cook the shark and anything else nearby. <laughs> which would not achieve our aim of shark self-defence, it would just make the oceans more dangerous for everyone. <laughs> Still, this idea has potential, as most sharks die to being caught up in fishing trawler nets. Um, so giving the shark some ability to cut through those nets would be very useful. And we can achieve this with well-established existing technologies, such as large blades. <laughs> of course, it may be possible to further refine this concept for use underwater through biomim biomimicry. I appear to have invented a knife-wielding tentacle. <laughs> uh, if anybody would like to volunteer to come and turn it off, that'd be just fine by me. As I said, some further research may be required. <laughs> Another suggestion I received while researching this is to make the sharks poisonous somehow, for example, using genetic engineering, in the hopes of discouraging humans from catching them and eating them. Unfortunately, again, this doesn't quite work because humans are quite happy to eat potentially poisonous food, <laughs> even paying a premium for it. However, if we just let the public know that these sharks have been genetically modified... <laughs> Even if these modifications do absolutely nothing, people will still boycott sharks on principle, which is exactly the result we're looking for. And this brings us nicely onto the topic of how we can best manage public opinion, which is commonly overlooked when it comes to cutting-edge science research. Uh, and sharks, we have an uphill battle here. Sharks are already the most hated creatures in the ocean before we make any of our improvements to them. <laughs> Not only that, as Mr. Boulay previously discussed, there is the issue in conservation biology of survival of the cutest, where animals that are most appealing to humans receive top priority when it comes to conservation efforts. I mean, you've old at the power of pandas, but these things can barely even reproduce without lots of outside encouragement. That's, that's really the bare minimum for a viable species. <laughs> and yet we funnel many, millions into preserving them. So, what can we do about this? Perhaps the most obvious avenue is to look for celebrity endorsements 
to try and encourage people to think more positively of sharks. But it turns out that celebrity disapproval or even outright opposition <laughs> could be even more effective. <laughs> Additionally, there's an intriguing paper which suggests that people have more positive attitudes towards sharks if they live near a large local shark population. <laughs> it's also perhaps the most interesting finding of this paper was this positive attitude is not diminished when shark attacks occur in the area. Um, in this case, I'm talking about attacks on sharks rather than, no, attacks by sharks rather than on sharks, just to clarify. Um, so it's obvious that what we can do is introduce sharks to more areas, expand their range artificially, <laughs> so that more people can experience this effect. Uh, there are a couple of issues with this. Firstly, this would break a lot of different laws. Um, <laughs> there are more, I just didn't have space. And, and, and also, it would still be limited to coastal settlements. <laughs> However, <laughs> We are already going to be gen genetically engineering these sharks anyway. <laughs> so, we could include uh, traits from, for instance, the lungfish that would allow them to survive on land. <laughs> this would expand their range massively. We could have local shark populations near every major population center of humans on the planet. And, according to that paper, public opinion would subsequently skyrocket, which is just what we need for shark conservation. Not only that, but through genetic engineering, we can tackle the survival of the cutest head-on by giving sharks traits which humans find appealing, such as large eyes and a blush response. <laughs> this is the shark of the future. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I'm assuming you've already got this past an ethics committee, um, and I can't see why anyone wouldn't want to have a sword above their head constantly. But can I just check, have you checked in with the sharks that they actually want these modifications? Uh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I can't see why we wouldn't, really. <laughs> So, your presentation raised certain questions in my mind, and <laughs> one of them regarded, well, why, why stop at sharks? <laughs> Humans kill all kinds of things. Um, and looking at <clears throat> this image in particular, I thought to myself, leaks. Leaks. Humans kill a lot of leaks. And if you were to give leaks kind of weapons and feet, you, you basically got triffids. <laughs> Just a thought. Hmm. It, it's an intriguing thought, but I think with, triffid, with creating triffids, we'd have a lot more work to do. I mean, you don't have enough inertia system, so it's questionable whether their suffering from humans is ethically relevant. <laughs> But that is another option, actually. We could just engineer the nervous systems out of all the animals on the planet. So, <laughs> no. That's another option. Thank you very much. Louis.